insightful viewers, welcome to Golden Age Technology on Supreme Master Television for the first in a two-part series on some of the latest advances in cornea surgery. This week we explore the use of artificial corneas or keratoprostheses in corneal transplantations, also known as cornea keratoplasties. What's so special about the cornea? Quite a lot, actually. Imagine you are a cornea. You are a clear dome-shaped window at the front of the eye, looking out onto the world. Your job is providing two-thirds of the eye's focusing power, using your shiny transparent refracting surface and protecting the iris and pupil behind you. With no blood supply, you get your oxygen directly from the air. And you are extremely sensitive. You have more nerve endings than anywhere else in the body. That's why, if something touches you, your split-second reflex causes the eyelids to blink. Supreme Master Television had the pleasure of meeting a leading authority in cornea surgery, Dr. Shiraz Daya, Medical Director at the Center for Sight Clinic in the UK, to discuss recent advancements in keratoplasty. Dr. Daya is known globally for his work and often performs pioneering ophthalmic procedures. He was the very first eye surgeon in Britain to perform LASIK, a laser vision correction procedure. Dr. Dyer is regularly invited to speak throughout the world on such topics as treatment of corneal diseases and laser eye surgery techniques. When does someone need to undergo keratoplasty? The main bulk of corneal surgery is corneal transplantation. There are many diseases that uh, unfortunately affect the cornea. If you take a look at this, this is a cross section of an eye, and this area here is the cornea. It's transparent and it, it's curved and it acts like a lens. So if there are any problems in terms of clarity, the corneas get cloudy, you know, sometimes you see people with this blue eye, the, the central area of blue, the eyes aren't clear, they've got a problem with their cornea. Or if there's a problem in terms of shape of the cornea, there's a condition called keratoconus, where the cornea is shaped a bit like a cone. Well, that's like an abnormal lens. They can't see through that. So those are two sorts of indications where we have to replace the cornea. Either all of it, depending on where the problem lies, or parts of it. And more and more now, with modern surgery, we're replacing only the bits that are abnormal and, and transplanting with tissue that's been donated by somebody who's died. So we take their corneas, we go through an eye banking process to make sure that the quality of the cornea is good and it's suitable for transplantation. Keratoplasty has been performed for over 100 years and is the most common and enjoys the highest success rate of all transplant procedures. It's the oldest transplant ever performed and the first transplant performed from one human to another, from a cadaver um, eye to a human uh, being. And what's been done conventionally, probably has not changed for about a hundred years, is this, where the cloudy area of the cornea, the central area is removed, a circular opening is made, it's removed and replaced with a, with a similar sized button from a donor cornea that's, that's transparent and clear. So here you'll see the, the, the patient's prepared with drops and, and anesthetic, and that cornea is removed, the disease cornea is removed. And then we take some clear tissue from a donor and put that in place and it's, and it's stitched in place. So that's how a conventional cornea transplant is performed. Artificial corneas are considered the frontier of corneal transplantation technology. Dr. Dyer now explains further. Ultimately, I believe that artificial corneas will take over where we manufacture corneas in a laboratory, but then they're not from another human source, so there's no chance of rejection. And what we're doing is replacing this clear area, this transparent area, with something artificial, and it stays clear. The challenge there is to get it to integrate and knit with the body, and to stay clear. That's what we have been working on, uh, we at uh, the ophthalmic community, and they're making progress in that regard too. There is a new material that's available, 
that uh, is being investigated at the moment and it shows quite a lot of promise and there are many workers around the world developing similar materials that maybe hopefully we'll be able to replace with the need for eye banks and corneas in the long term. We're not there yet, the way to go, but that's where the future is going to go. And then when, you t when it comes to developing countries, we don't need to worry about eye banks. We will have uh, transplantable material that will be sitting on a shelf that we hopefully better take, open up and, and, and uh, uh, stitch in place of a, of a diseased cornea. There are several types of artificial corneas available in the market today. However, there are still many challenges to overcome to create one that requires minimal post-operative care. It's more to do with integration with the, and biocompatibility. It has to be compatible with the human body and to have it last the long term. So we do have artificial corneas right now. These are plastic devices that fit into the eye and we have been doing this for, for many years now. The problem with, the, with, with this technology is that patients need to be followed up very, very closely. It's a lifesaver for them, it's fantastic. They get, get they great vision, but they need to see us on a regular basis because they can get infections, they can get glaucoma, um, and these, these things can melt down and they need to be patched on a, on a periodic basis if that happens to them. So they need an awful lot of follow-up care. We want, to, we want to get to a stage where we don't have that. And the only way that's going to happen is if the material that's manufactured is, is, is completely compatible with the cornea. The way an artificial cornea is attached to the eye differs depending on the device selected. One of the most well-known artificial corneas was developed at Harvard Medical School in the United States. Klaus Dolman developed this device. It used to be called the dolman doan carriage prosthesis. There are two different types. One is a bit like a cornea. It's housed within corneal tissue, and then we stitch that uh, cornea into the eye, just like we would a transplant. There's a second variety, and that's the type 2. This is in conditions where the eye is extremely dry. If we were to put a type 1 in, it would it, it bound to fail. It would just melt and fall out. And we'll, in, in the type 2, what we do is we remove the eyelid. We just keep the skin in place. We transplant the, the device in to the, into the eye, and we take the eye skin over and close it so that all they've got is skin. And then about three months later, we cut a hole through the skin and this optic, clear bit of plastic lens, pops out and they can see through that. It's quite dramatic, uh, they get instantaneously get, get vision. Um, and that's the type two dolman don't catch prosthesis. We've changed the technique a little bit. We take um, tissue from the bone, the lining of the bone called the periosteum, and we put it over that device and we put skin on top. And the reason why we do that is to retain the um, artificial cornea, the, the keratoprosthesis. One of the problems with these things is they worm their way out. With periosteum, which is very tough and lines the bone, it's used for manufacturing bone, we use that on the eye. It belongs to the patient, so we take their own tissue and transplant it. It's tough material. I've not seen any extrude yet. It doesn't allow those prosthesis to fall out. And so that's the deviation of the technique that we've developed ourselves. Dr. Dyer has a number of patient success stories. People who've received an artificial cornea and had their lives utterly transformed as a result. Theresa Kelly in Dublin's a good one. She was man for many years. She saw children grow up. They got married, they had their own children. And then she got a vision back and she could see her daughter for the first time in 12, 15 years. That was quite dramatic for her. She suddenly became independent. Um, the other one was the one we just did recently, um, Norman Simpson, who was on the news. In his case, he'd had transplant after transplant in his only eye, and he'd had some trauma. He, his eye was also protruding from the socket from thyroid disease. So a colleague of mine at the, at the hospital here, we worked together, did some lid surgery, got him to be able to close his eyes. And once that was accomplished, it took about 18 months. Once he did that, then we did, went ahead and did the, the carriage prosthesis. First day was a bit disappointing, but uh, he wasn't seeing very well. But a week later, he was reading the newspaper and reading his Christmas cards, and uh, he was now walking around. So that, that was fantastic and very gratifying. But in terms of touching stories, I, I've got to say, it's, it's the patients that can tell you from their perspective. For us, we do this every day in terms of vision correction. It is definitely moving to see patients who have been blind for a long time regain vision and feel 
a lot more useful than themselves and they're not able to function. Our respectful gratitude, Dr. Dyer, for your bringing the precious gift of sight to so many patients. May your dedication to continually advancing the field of eye surgery bring hope and happiness to many more people worldwide. For details on Dr. Dyer, please visit www.centerforsight.com. Please join us again next Friday on Golden Age Technology for the conclusion of our series on some of the latest advances in cornea surgery. Thank you, kind viewers, for your company today on Golden Age Technology on Supreme Master Television. Vegetarianism, the noble way of living, is up next after noteworthy news. May you and your loved ones live long and prosper.